it's um so in in our our family uh we are actually missing several years of baby pictures of our children and um the reason for that is uh, we had all of our baby pictures on a laptop. This is back before cloud storage was a thing, and somebody stole our laptop. And so there's several years of baby pictures that are just kind of missing from our family history. And, you know, in one sense, that's a really sad thing. In another sense, it's not like the biggest injustice in the world. But the, the reality is is that I'm, I know it's one of two people who, st who stole my laptop, right? I, I don't know for sure who did it, but I know the two people who it was one of them. Um, and uh, that's, that's like frustrating, right? And, and these are people that actually I had invited into my life, right? I had offered friendship to them. And one of them, I'm not sure which one, betrayed that. And I still have to deal with the consequences of that. And I wanted to start with that story. Again, it's a small way, but I would imagine everybody in the room has experienced some sort of betrayal in your life, right? Some, some sort of just like dealing with the reality of just the absolute depravity of human beings, right? And of course, if we're honest, we probably also had to look in the mirror and deal with that too, but it, it's just a lot more frustrating and uh, anger-inducing when we deal with it from other people, right? We're a lot more understanding of our own depravity than we are other people. Um, and so we're gonna be talking about that this morning, so, right? So, so scripture testifies to the fact that innocent people suffer at the hands of sinners, right? And oftentimes, Scripture points at the fact that while this is happening, God is waiting, right? This is something that Scripture points at. And we live in a world that tempts us to believe in the power of evil to accomplish our desires. There's, that's a real temptation, right? That I can go out and I can accomplish what I want through my own methods, and it'll, it'll work. But the reality is, is that God is offering us a different way, right? God is offering us a strength through holiness, a strength through his presence that actually allows us to persist in justice and righteousness and forgiveness in the midst of waiting for God to fulfill his promises, to flip all of the, the depravity of this world on its head and to bring about his kingdom, right? And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. So we're going to read Daniel 11, which is a fairly lengthy chapter, but we're going to read through it. So if you guys want, you can turn there with me, um, either in your, in your books or on your phones or however you want to read scripture. I'm reading out of the NIV. And this is chapter 11, which again, just a reminder, um, chapters 10, 11, and 12 are actually an entire vision. And so we're reading really kind of the meat of Daniel's vision. And, and there's a... We'll get to this, but think, just think like Game of Thrones or some other kind of like political kind of intrigue as we're reading this, okay? But th again, this is, this is a vision that Daniel is having, right? So this is, this is where he picks up. Uh, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. That's kind of the, the, the tail end of chapter 10. Now then I tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. The kings of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. One from her family line will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years, he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. 
Then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army, but it will be defeated. When the army is carried off, the kings of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet he will not remain triumphant. For the king of the north will muster another army larger than the first, and after several years he will advance with a huge army, fully equipped. In those times, many will rise against the king of the south. Those who are violent amongst your own people rebel in in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. Then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture a fortified city. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land and will have the power to destroy it. He will determine to come oh, yeah, he will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south, and he will give a daughter in marriage to him in order to overthrow the kingdom, but his plans will not succeed or help him. Then he will turn his attention to the coastlands and will take many of them, but a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back on him. After this, he will turn back towards the fortress of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure, and he will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully, and with only a few people he will rise to power." When the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth amongst his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the kings of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provision will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away and many will fall in battle. The two kings with their hearts bent on evil will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail, because an end will come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it and then return to his own country." At the appointed time, he will invade the south again, but this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the holy covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the holy covenant. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end for it will still come at the appointed time. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God unknown to his ancestors. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortress with the help of a foreign God and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. At the times of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. 
He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt, but with the Libyans and the Cushites in submission. Reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. All right, that was a good chunk of scripture right there. You guys okay? Did you guys make it through? I think that was like six minutes of uh, just, uh, like I said, Game of Thrones, right? So a little bit of context for that, what's going on there. So first of all, this is a vision, right? And, and just in the vision itself, you have these two kingdoms, the king of the, king of the north and the king of the south that are fighting. Uh, and if you didn't catch it, you've got the, God's people, the nation of Israel in the middle. That's the beautiful land, right? And the temple that gets referenced. Uh, and this is actually a vision of the, 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 the coming of Alexander the Great, the, the Greek uh, empire that took over after the Persians. And after Alexander's death, uh, his empire was split into four, four generals, took over four different chunks of the empire. And two of them specifically uh, ended up being north and south of the nation of Israel and fighting with each other constantly. And in the middle of that constant battle was the nation of Israel, right? And, and Israel was kind of going back and forth, and sometimes they would ally with one side or the other. Sometimes they would fight with one side or the other. Sometimes they would try and maintain their independence. Sometimes they would just acquiesce. There's this constant political kind of intrigue that, that Israel's caught up in the midst of. And, man, it really is crazy. As a matter of fact, why don't we throw up the next, the next slide? So this is, uh, how many people watch Game of Thrones? I actually haven't watched it. So, all right. So this, I just happen to know that this, I, I had to like research it, right? So this is, I think, I, my understanding is that there aren't really any good guys in, in the episode at all, right? There's no like heroes. But this guy in the front is sort of kind of a hero. And he confides early on in what he thinks is his friend who ends up uh, betraying him, right? So this is kind of like one of these like first big moments of betrayal in the series, and uh, man, like doing, re reading about some of the, um, the events uh, in history that, that go along with this chapter, right, that, that this chapter is talking about, you have, so there was one particular queen who they think is being referenced in this, in this passage who, she was married to one king in an attempt for power, had, um, had some children, and then was offered marriage to a better king. So she had her, her husband and her children poisoned so that she could go, like, have more power in this other kingdom. And I'm like, what, <laughs> what is that? Like, how does that? And, and, but that's just one story. There's story after story after story of these dynasties where these people are so hungry for power that they're willing to sacrifice their own family members in their pursuit of what they think they want, right? It's this crazy picture of depravity that, again, I think we, we read through a, a, a ton of it, but you just get that sense of this constant fighting, constant evil, this like churn of, of just ungodly desire that continues and continues and continues, and God's people are caught in the middle of it. Right? They're just caught in the middle of it. There, there's that line that says really briefly, those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered, right? These are like the wise people amongst, amongst God's people who are suffering at the hands of, you know, and so again, when I, when I tell you a story about somebody stealing my laptop with baby pictures on it, it pales in comparison to something like this. But the, this is the reality of life in this world is that there are there, there are real temptations to pursue what we want through evil means, um, right? And yet, we also have this example of this persistent, I would almost use the word stupid, hope in the face of all of this, right? Um, yeah, you can throw the next slide up. This is, I, 
This is a, just a picture from the internet, but I still remember uh, I was at a friend's wedding, and um, we were near, near the, the silos downtown, and there was this weird stunted tree growing off the th top of one of the silos, right? And it's like, first of all, how did that get there, you know? It's like some bird had to carry it up there, or the wind took a seat up. I don't, I don't know how it got up there. And, you know, obviously it wasn't, um, wasn't like the best picture of a healthy tree, you know, because that's not where trees are supposed to grow is on the top of silos. And yet there it was, and I was thinking about how it's probably uniquely situated to spread its seed to other parts of the city and to actually produce more trees, right? It was kind of like, huh, it was this interesting, and I just felt like God was speaking to me through it, that like... <laughs> that's how his kingdom works. Like, that's how the life of the kingdom works, right? Is that God can make things grow in all sorts of places that you wouldn't expect, and he can accomplish tremendous good through that, again, in ways that you just wouldn't expect. And so this is a picture of that. I don't know if you guys have ever, like, I remember we were in um, uh, Vienna and looking at some of the beautiful cathedrals, and a lot of them would have trees growing, like, 500 feet up out of the side of the cathedral. You're like, what the heck? That's crazy. But it's it's this, I think it's this picture of, well, like persistent and almost stupid hope in the face of all of the evil that confronts us in the world and that, that Daniel is being confronted with this in this passage. And we looked last week at just the reality of the fear that Daniel was dealing with just because of this vision. But today we're going to talk a little bit more about hope and holiness and righteousness and forgiveness and anger and what it means to be people who are tempted to, um, I guess, to strength or to pursuit of our, our desires through that, that just, well, through the violent pursuit of our own desires and, and who cares what it costs in terms of other people's lives. But Daniel and his friends, we've been reading through this book, again, for a long time. They, they actually model for us. I think Daniel is the perfect person to speak to us about hope, right? So we've got, whether it's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are put in front of the king, and they're told, you know, worship my statue, or I'll toss you in the fire. And their response is, first of all, defiance, not, not in any kind of like a rebellious sense, but in a sense of, hey, we're going to serve God, not you. Like we, and, and actually, they, they're even pretty clear that we've been serving you. Like we've been willing to be, you know, servants in your kingdom, but we will not worship you. Our worship belongs to God alone. And in spite of that, you can threaten us with whatever you want. We actually believe that God has the power to save us. And if he doesn't, we still won't bow down to your idol. Daniel himself, right, gets thrown in the lion's den. And again, there's this persistent and almost, dare I say, stupid hope in the face of this incredible threat of violence and annihilation. And I think, you know, we can probably see that in the lives of people in this room or in people of faith that we've known who have been confronted with whether it's injustices in their lives or betrayal by people in their lives or just the hardship of life itself who have actually persisted in hope, right? And I think that that word anticipation is, is a good word, right? Because hope isn't just, it's not just, oh, it'll be okay, or I'm not worried about the hard things, or I'm just not going to pay attention to the bad stuff. Hope is the persistent belief that the future will be better than the present, right? Hope is this, this sense of, I am actually waiting for the good thing to come. One of the, one of the, the passages in Scripture that has always spoken to me about this in, in um uh, Romans chapter 8, Paul uses the, the picture of childbirth to talk about the relationship between suffering to God's goodness. He says, right, so a woman who is suffering through childbirth is suffering real pain, and yet there's this sense of anticipation or expectation that something good is actually coming at the end of this process, right? And that as Christians, as believers, that ought to be our attitude or our posture or our relationship to injustice, to suffering, to pain, to the, the depravity of this world is that we look at it and we go, man, this really is not good. This is painful. This is horrible. And yet I know that God is at work in the midst of it. Where is God at work? 
Like, what is it that God is bringing out of this? Where is God fulfilling his promises in and through this, right? And that that's the attitude and the posture that believers ought to have when we're confronted with these things. And so there's, there's a choice that we have to make in this. And this is where, uh, <laughs> sorry, I have to tell the story. So uh, this the, the, this past summer where there were, there were um, some protests and then also some of those protests got a little, um, a little violent, right? And so there were, there were people breaking things and burning things. And um, uh, I was talking to my boys and they wanted to go. They're like, hey, we want to go check it out. And I'm like, oh, okay, why do you want to go? Well, it just seems like it would be a cool thing to do. And I'm like, okay, here's the deal. I know what you want to do. You want to go break stuff and you're not allowed to go break stuff. Uh, and... Um, because, like, those are, those are people's things, and you could get hurt, and people could get hurt, and that's not actually, so again, if you've never been a teenage boy, for all of the, the ladies in the room, in the heart of every teenage boy is the di- desire to break things, right? It's just in there. So anyway, this is, this is what was said, right? And this is where the picture comes from, is after I have this conversation with my boys, one of them goes, oh, I've always wanted to throw a Molotov cocktail. It's literally what he said to me. Uh, Anyway, so I had to have a picture of a Molotov cocktail up there. Um, so that's funny, and I, I don't actually think my kids would ever actually do that. <laughs> I'm looking at my wife. <laughs> do you think they would? <laughs> the jury's still out. I've never thrown a Molotov cocktail, so I think you can make it through your teenage years without doing that. Anybody else? <laughs> All right. So, but, but the point is, I mean, that's, hopefully that's somewhat humorous, but, but the point is, is that there's like a, there's a choice there that has to be made, right? That, and, and this was a choice that Jesus was confronted with and the people of Jesus' day were confronted with. So that word zealot, that was actually a political party of, of during Jesus' day, right? There were a group of people called zealots who in their eyes, the way to faithfully serve God was to pick up a sword and kill Romans, That's how you serve God, right? And they were called zealots. In fact, Jesus invited one of them to come be his disciples, right? There's Simon called Peter and there's Simon the zealot. And he was invited to come and be one of Jesus' disciples. And Jesus explicitly rejected this path and yet also invited somebody who was a zealot to come and learn a different way, right? And so there's there's this, this temptation to pursue our own desires by giving in to, you know, you guys have all seen, seen um, the original Star Wars trilogy, right? Where the em- emperor's like, Luke, I can feel the strength of your anger. Like, give yourself to it. There's power there. You know, I don't, I don't have the exact line memorized. But, but it's like giving yourself into this dark power that is real power, right? We can use that and channel that to accomplish things that might actually it might actually work at some level to do that. But the problem is, is it doesn't actually work, right? It has, it has costs that come along with it. And uh, so out of, um, this is actually out of this Sunday's lectionary reading, which we don't usually read from the lectionary, but I was hanging out with Mark and he's been hanging out with, I guess you've been hanging out with a lot of Anglicans lately. So, so we were talking about some of these passages. And uh, from First Thessalonians, Paul writes, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. And so there's, there's a strength that comes with holiness that looks very different than the strength that comes with wrath. Right? And you guys have probably felt both of these things in your life. I would imagine that every single person in this room has given yourself into your wrath and felt the power that comes with that. Right? And, and if you're like me, you've probably unleashed it at a spouse or a child or a parent and then had to deal with the consequences. Right? Where in that moment, you felt strength and maybe you even got what you wanted in the moment, but then you had to live with the consequences. Well, there's a very different kind of strength that comes through holiness the kind of strength that we see, again, modeled in Jesus. It's one of the things that's most impressive to me about him. There's lots of things that are impressive about him, but is his capacity to be righteous and self-controlled and courageously so in the midst of conflict, right? To where people are coming at him, and he is not being weak at all, but he's also not giving in to those darker, like he's not just responding with hatred or with, right? 
It's like his capacity to just stand for righteousness in the midst of these really trying circumstances where people are out to get him. It, it's just impressive to me. And that's this picture of the strength of holiness that I think God wants us to choose. Uh, and Paul says in Ephesians, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and don't give the devil a foothold. And so I think there's, there's this question. Sometimes, sometimes Christians can believe, well, anger is sinful in and of itself. But I think scripture is pretty clear that anger isn't sinful. It is more about what we do with our anger, how we allow it to fester or how we allow it to motivate us to act. That's really where the problem is, right? Um, and so that, that's the question is what is, I mean, Scripture's clear that, that, that God gets angry, and it's recorded in several places that Jesus was angry, right? So again, I would say it's pretty clear that anger itself isn't the problem, but the question is, what is the purpose of anger then, right? And I think, very simply put, anger is there to arouse our sense of injustice, right? When we are angry, it's because we perceive something going on around us to be wrong, and that's why we're mad, right? Now, that begs the question, is it injustice or is it perceived injustice, right? <laughs> Maybe we're the ones that are wrong, not that other person, right? So, so that's where, again, what do we do with our anger? It also begs the question. It's not just about, uh, you know, our ability to perceive that something is wrong, but also do we actually see the truth behind it? Like, what is actually going on? What's causing this? Um, I shared a story recently with you guys about somebody that, that was co constantly uh, just hurting me and a lot of other people through their words. And it took years, really, for me to come, come to the realization that this person was acting not out of a desire to hurt people, but out of fear, right? So there was a real injustice. Like, I was angry because there was something wrong. But I didn't know the truth of what was causing the problem for years, right? And so, again, it begs the question, are we able to, you know, do we have real injustice or perceived injustice? Do we actually see the truth of what's going on or not? And then also, what do we do to act, right? How do we act? And so the next slide, um, I think the word justice, it gets co-opted by politics, which is fine, right? There, there is a sense in which justice and politics kind of go together. But I think there's also a sense in which that blinds us to the fact that there are all sorts of acts of justice that we have the power to engage in right now. There is, we don't have to vote, we don't have to march, we don't have to get other people to go along. We could just go out and do justice right now, right? Um, I mean, even, you know, boy, I really wish that that, that sidewalk was shoveled. Hey, do you own a shovel? <laughs> go shovel it, right? Like, I mean, I've been mad at neighbors who won't shovel their sidewalks because I have to walk on it and I own a shovel, right? So, the, and, and this is where we see, I think, the, the, one of the, the two places where it's specifically recorded that Jesus got angry. Uh, this is in Mark 3. So it says, Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal this man on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked the crowd, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they remained silent. They wouldn't answer the question. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now set aside, we could, we could do a lot with their response to Jesus' healing, right? It's kind of a crazy response. But Jesus is angry. I think he's angry with good cause, right? Here is this man in pain, has been in, in desperate situation for probably his whole life, and there's a group of quote-unquote godly people who don't care at all and are just looking for an opportunity to use this man's pain and suffering to trap Jesus. I would say that that's something to be angry about. But then what does Jesus do with it? He heals the man, <laughs> right? It's like, this is a situation that shouldn't be the way that it is. Okay, well, so what should we do with that anger? How about if we solve the problem? How about if we do good? How about if we act out righteousness in this situation, right? And so that's one of the things that, that's one of the paths that I think is for, for godly people to take when, when we are confronted with 
the, the craziness of the world in ways that make us angry is to ask the question, okay, well, what is it that God has given us the power to do in this situation to make things right, to do the right thing or to solve some sort of a problem in this situation, right? But there's also another, I think, another course of action that is called for, and that's forgiveness. And I've got a picture of a prison up there because I think... Uh, I mean, how many of you guys, and I'm assuming you'll all raise your hands at this point, how many of you guys have ever wrestled with unforgiveness towards somebody? You've been angry at somebody enough that it sat with you for longer than a few days, right? That's probably everybody in the room. You know what it feels like to be bound to your anger and bound to your unforgiveness, right? It is a prison. You guys have probably heard the quote. It's, uh, let's see if I can remember off the top of my head. Yeah, unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping it'll kill the other person, right? You guys have heard that? <laughs> so that's, it's, it's and it, this is at the heart, really, of the gospel message, is that, that through Jesus, we have been offered forgiveness, and that forgiveness is a forgiveness that sets us free, right? We've been forgiven of our own sins, but we've been also offered the power to be released from our anger or our bitterness or our frustration at others. And this is, you know... Yeah, this was something that was a big part of my journey early on as as a as a believer. Is, you know, I think most sixteen year olds love and hate their father. Probably worship and hate their father is maybe like a, a but I, I don't know if that's true for for women as well. But certainly that's that's a common path for men. And um, and I had just real frustration and bitterness and and discord with my dad and. Um, in some ways, it was actually probably a real benefit to the situation that I ended up really mistreating him a ton. For several years, I just, I just sinned against him because of my feelings towards him. And so when I began to practice my faith and try to follow Jesus, one of the things that just God was constantly putting his finger on is the fact that I actually had to ask my father for forgiveness and I feel like I had spent several years just sinning against him so, so regularly and so badly that, I don't know, somehow in the process I had like lost my anger towards him and my frustration towards him. Um, and so, it, I don't know, it just got dealt with. There were a lot of other things that God has had to deal with me since then, but I feel like early on in my faith I really had to deal with reconciling to my father, uh, asking him to forgive me and offering him forgiveness in the process. And um, I don't know, there, there really is just a tremendous amount of freedom. And this, this, this doesn't mean that I have not fought with my father since or have not had disagreements <laughs> with him since. Um, yeah, you're not, not allowed to give me looks like that. She's like, you have to be honest if you're going to preach. So, um, right. So it's not like we haven't had disagreements. But, man, there is a ton of freedom there, I think, and, and has been for my whole adult life because of the way that God dealt with some of the things in my heart and my attitudes towards my dad, right? And so again, this is, this is at the heart of what God is wanting to do in us through Jesus. Um, and so, yeah, this, this, where we're, where we're going to end this morning is where we're going to end every morning, which is with preparing to take communion. And so you can put, yeah, the next slide up there. This is... Um, a uh, statue called uh, Swords into Plowshares, which comes out of, you guys are probably familiar, which, yeah, you can, I think, hopefully you can tell, like, that's uh, somebody using a hammer to beat a sword into a plowshare, something that you would plow the ground with, right? And this comes out of both Isaiah and Micah, and it's this prophecy about what God will do, right? And so a sword obviously is a tool, but it's a tool that is used for the purpose of killing other human beings, Right? And, you know, you could argue that maybe there are times and places where that's, that tool is necessary. Obviously, Christians debate whether or not there's ever a call for violence. But, but the reality is, is that some people would say, well, no, there is a time where you need a sword to defend or to promote justice. But clearly, Scripture points towards a day when that tool will no longer be needed. There will be no more swords, right? And, and a plowshare is a tool you use to bring forth life from the earth, food for people to eat, right? And so swords will be no longer needed to the point where we won't even like stick them in the closet just in case. We'll turn them into tools for tilling the earth, right? That's this picture of this prophetic future that, again, we see recorded several places in Scripture. 
And I think that's, <laughs> that is who Jesus is. That is what he has done and is doing, is he's, he's uh, working in us that reality. He's offering that to us. He has gone to the cross to confront the powers of evil, to confront the powers of sin, to confront the powers of death, and he defeated them on the cross. And that victory then is offered to us, and this taking of bread and juice and eating it is one of the, the signs that Jesus gave to us as the symbolic act of um, identifying with him and, and receiving that life and that victory for ourselves that came at the cost of his death, right? That's, that's what this symbolizes. And so as we get ready to take this, this is, you know, you don't have to take this, right? I would say this is for people who have actually said yes to that. And so if you're in the room and you're like, I don't know if I'm sure if I've done that or if I want to do that, or actually I feel like I've got some stuff that I just kind of want to do business with God and I'm not going to take communion this morning. That's fine. Totally fine. You don't have to do that. But also there's n there is no reason that you can't take this. There aren't any barriers between you and what is offered to you through Jesus on the cross. It's available to anybody who wants it, right? And so the way we'll do this just practically is in a second, yeah, Zach's going to come up and play some music, and um, I'll lead you in a little bit of reflection, and then I'll invite you up. You can come up the front. You can take, uh, there's gluten-free on the small plate and <laughs> gluten on the, on the other plate. You can uh, grab it and then take it back to your seats. You can go down the side aisles uh, to sit down, and then um, we'll all take it together. So you can just hold on to it until I tell you otherwise. But I think maybe the question, the question for reflection this morning is, um, where are you holding a sword, right? Where's a place where you're holding on to anger towards somebody or, um, or even just prepared to do, <laughs> probably, most of you guys probably aren't prepared to do real violence, maybe a few of you in the room, but prepared to do battle, right? Where are you holding a sword? Um, and what, do you, what, what does God want you to do with it? How does God want to deal with the sword that's in your hand? What is he inviting you to do with that? So there's a couple of questions for you just to, to sit with. And God, we pray that you would help us to see that. Help us to just identify that place where we're tempted to pick up a sword or where we're holding a sword or we're tempted to use a sword, God. And um, yeah, just speak to us about that. We pray you come now. the elements of communion. You can come up now and grab a, a wafer and some juice. To the cross I look To the cross I cling The suffering I do dream Of oh, its work I do sing Savior, bruised and crushed, so that God is love, God is just. Sweetly broken 
holy surrender. This is what uh, Paul writes about the communion, the communion meal. He said, I received from the Lord what I am passing on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So go ahead and take the bread and eat it in remembrance of Jesus. And Paul goes on to say that in the same way after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and drink the juice. And Paul goes on to say that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so Jesus, we just remember your sacrifice. We remember your suffering. The way that you confronted the darkness in this world. And we also express our hope that you have promised to return. You've promised to set all things right. We experience your life here and now in the midst of the darkness, but we also know, God, that there's a time in the future when the darkness will end. And we pray, God, that you would make us strong with your strength, that we would be people who live in anticipation and hope. that can't be quenched. Hmm. Why don't we stand? I think that verse that uh, Cheryl read is a great benediction for this morning. All right, Paul writes, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.